blessings, everyone. Welcome to Answers. I thank you so much for joining with me. I'm Dale, and I thank you that you've actually set aside some time right here to gather together. You know, we don't take that for granted in any way. It always amazes me. It's just one of the most exciting things uh, when people will just simply gather together uh, to study the Word of God, to speak of the things of God, to worship together, to pray together, uh, to do something in the name of the kingdom, to help somebody else, whatever it may be, as kingdom individuals, which is what we are, as kingdom creatures, when people will do that. Because I know that the ways of the world, and I know that Satan is sly, and we can so often be tempted to do something else, tempted to go some other direction, tempted to uh, say, well, you know, I'm just going to stay home, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And so, uh, anyway, I thank you for uh, gathering with us because uh, God really blesses the time that you place in his word, the time that you look at things. And so, uh, spread the word. We've actually got several new folks that have joined us of late, whether you're viewing uh, when it's being broadcast on uh, WCQT on TV uh, 27, or whatever it may be on your cable network. It's different on all cable networks, right? Or if you're streaming us uh, over the internet, which a lot of people do that, you know, time shift. Uh, some of our dear friends, I, I love them, they tell me, we get up on Saturday morning, and we fix breakfast, and we sit down, and open the iPad, and, and and pull up the show and see what you had to say. <laughs> and I said, well, I hope it's not so much what I have to say, but what the word of the Lord has to say, what the Most High God is saying to each of us. And so uh, spread the word about that and share it with one another. What we've been looking at lately is we've been looking at what the scripture has to say about leadership and that those that God calls within his body to lead. Now, we, we could spend many, many weeks and months upon this. And there has been many, great books written about leadership, okay? Many phenomenal books written about leadership. As a matter of fact, can, can I tell you a story? Hey, Nick, is it okay if I tell a story? Let me tell you a story. Uh, one of the most uh, profound books on leadership <clears throat> is a book called uh, The Making of a Leader, okay? <laughs> By Frank DiMazio, The Making of a Leader. And uh, I, I, the story is this, how I found that book and how I came about that book. And it's just interesting how these several things came together that so impacted me and still continue to impact me some 25 years later, I think. Probably about that long, maybe 30 years now. I'm not sure how long. Um, one morning, I woke up. Okay, woke up one morning. And I thought, this thought went through my mind that I needed to go and find a book. That's, I saw, just go find a book. Now, this is long before there were Kindles. This is long before you had books on computers. And as a matter of fact, we didn't even have PCs then, personal computers, on a daily basis at that time. And so where I was living uh, at that area, the general area, which is a very, very large metro area, uh, had a, about five Christian bookstores that I would go to from time to time, whatever they may be. And so I got up that morning, and I went in search of a book. I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know what it was. But I, I just had sort of learned that when that crosses your mind and that type of thing happens, okay, Lord, you know, I'm going to take the step. See, quite often we think that faith is taking a step out. No, faith is not taking a step when you know where your foot's going to land. Faith is picking your foot up and not being quite certain where it's going to land, okay? So I got up that morning, and I don't remember the exact sequence that I went to, but I went to one bookstore, and this bookstore is uh, predominantly, uh, uh, it has a, a Catholic influence, let's say that way. But it had the coolest guy that worked back in the back, little bitty short black gentleman from uh, North Miami. And this guy told me, and I totally believe it, uh, because of how he was, he read the book of Ephesians every day. He said, I've been reading it every day for years. And well, the years wind up being decades. He could quote that book like you wouldn't believe. And so I went there, and I just, just walked through the stacks of books and didn't, you know, just walked, didn't see anything. Talked with him for a while. You know? And then I went to the other bookstore. Another bookstore is uh, sort of a Presbyterian background. The, the couple that owned it went to D. James Kennedy's church, Coral Ridge Presbyterian, Fort Lauderdale. Walked through there, uh, you know, spent some time there, didn't say anything, just walked. You know, just walked in, well, Lord, whatever it is, I'm doing it, you know. Went to the uh, the Baptist bookstore. They just opened the Baptist bookstore, and that was a good distance down. That was like a 30-mile drive down. It was south side of Miami. Went down there and went through all the stacks and everything. Just didn't say anything. Came back and went to uh, another one. It's like a Zondervan bookstore, I guess, a family bookstore, family Bible bookstore. Didn't see anything, and I thought, well, uh, I've got one more bookstore, and I'm going to go to it on the way home because I've spent the last seven or eight hours <laughs> walking through bookstores doing, you know, what I thought I was supposed to do, which was look for a book. Now, I'm, I'm totally ready to think, okay, well, I'm just being crazy and I'm being stupid, right? 
<laughs> nothing new there. I walk in this other bookstore, and this was just like a little privately owned thing in a pretty uh, uh, challenging part of town, shall we say. And when I walked in, instantly this happened, because uh, one, it's in the three bays of a shopping center. One bay had the greeting cards, one bay had um, uh, cassettes and CDs, and the other bay had books. And they didn't, they didn't have a lot of books. But when I walked in, this went off in my head. Go to the books. I walk into the books, and there's this long line of just uh, shelves of books. And this went in, off in my head. It's down on the bottom on the left, and it has a white spline, a white cover. And there's hundreds and hundreds of books, and I'm walking along, and I get sort of my eyes drawn to something. And I reach down there, and I pull it out, and the name of the book is The Making of a Leader by Frank DiMaggio. And I thought, okay. Well, I guess this is the one I'm supposed to get. So I get it and I start reading it. Well, as I was reading it, I went off to a conference uh, out of state and I took that book with me and I was staying at a bed and breakfast because this conference was at a town where I went to college and, and I heard they had this little bed and breakfast in what was an old rundown Victorian. Now it's just beautiful. So I was there by myself getting ready to go to this conference, having breakfast, and the gentleman who owns the place came up and served me breakfast and he looks down and he says, and I had that book, I was reading that book. He said, uh, I used to be Frank DiMazio's youth pastor. And I went, what? And he started telling me some really, really interesting tales, which I'm not going to get into right now. But the things they had to deal with with him, because he was very, very zealous, very young but very zealous, but he wasn't teachable, he wasn't controllable. And so the things that happened, it was just really intriguing. So that book really impacted me. I found out shortly thereafter that this other author that I'd encountered books in a different kind of way, maybe I'll share that story with you some other time, but uh, a similar thing happened, quite similar. I just bought these three books because I saw them. I thought those looked sort of interesting. It was years later I was studying something. I thought, Lord, what does this mean? I'm not sure what this is all about. And all of a sudden this goes off in my mind. You've got a book over there that will help explain that. And, and I had it on all my bookshelves and everything. And I went over and, and found this book. Well, this guy, his name is Kevin Connor. And I think he's still alive. He has to be in his 90s. He's, he lives in Australia. Turns out that Frank DiMazio is married to Kevin Connor's daughter. It's just, it's just strange how God will lead us and how he'll speak to us and how he'll reveal things to us if we listen, if we are in his word, if we're abiding in his presence, if we're abiding in his spirit, as we're going, he'll speak things to us. He'll reveal things to us. He'll clarify things to us. So anyway, I recommend that book, Frank DiMaggio, The Making of a Leader. Uh, it's about that thick. But he goes through the entire Bible and shows what God did in raising up leadership, how he raised up Moses, how he raised up Joshua, how he raised up David, the principles that come from this, Paul, all these things. And it's just very, very useful. We as the body of Christ, generally speaking, do not adhere to biblical principles. We don't do what the Bible tells us to do. Okay? We simply don't. And it doesn't matter if you're this denomination or that nom denomination or whatever. Uh, we have elements of it and little pieces of it, but then we take a truth right here and then we'll add our stuff to it. And depending upon where we are here in the Western world, we've had added Western mindsets to it. You know, things simply are not scriptural. And so what we're seeking to do now is just, let's just see what the scripture has to say about it. There's a lot of churches in our area right here that are undergoing times of a leadership transition uh, in, in the pastoral realm and staff realm and things like that. Well, that's one element. But these principles right here are talking about those who are the bishops. That's what the King James says. I got the King James right here. That's what the New American Standard over here calls overseers, uh, often referred to as elders. These are ones that give spiritual leadership to the body of Christ. Okay? They give spiritual leadership. They don't lord it over. Mother Scripture passages talk about that. You don't lord over. Uh, Moses was the example of that. God said Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. Now that caused him a lot of trouble because people would pop up and basically say, hey, who put you in charge? And he and Aaron would go, well, God. <laughs> you know, like, well, that wasn't satisfactory to some of the powers that be, in which they wound up paying for it, if you've ever read that account of, uh, of the revolt that took place right there. So anyway, if we were to adhere to these scriptures, to these principles that we've seen the last three, four weeks, and just acknowledging and allowing God to raise up the leadership, we would be totally, absolutely uh, transformed as his body. Most of the stuff that we deal with, with the conflict and things like that, would not happen in the way they do. Now, you would have conflict. You see conflict. You see it over in Acts 15. Acts 15 is a great chapter in understanding of how leadership is raised up, of how leadership functions, of how leaders function within the body of Christ because they had an issue. And the apostles and the elders and the church 
the entire church came together and they, they debated this, they discussed it, they listened to what was going on, what's happening. But you don't see what you see in a lot of churches. For, I'll give you an example of my background stuff. You don't see congregational rule. Okay? You don't see what the congregation rules over everything. And that's not saying the congregation have, doesn't have input. It does. The church has tremendous input. And I think it's wise to go to the church. And it's probably wise at times to go to the church and say, hey, give us your opinion right here. How many of y'all want to do it this way and how many of y'all want to do it that way? Nothing wrong with that. But when you come along and the congregation is the one who rules and makes decisions, and people say, well, we're a democracy because we're a democracy. No, that's a government. Okay? That's a, that's a man-made governmental thing. And people think that we in the United States are democracy. We're not a democracy. We're a representative republic. And there's a tremendous difference. A democracy is just half a step away from anarchy and chaos because it's just the rule of the, of, of the, of the majority at the moment, whatever that may be. But when you look at the Scripture, you see that God has designed some things, and he raises up people who will be leaders within the body of Christ. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading a portion of the Scripture right here. As a matter of fact, I may take a break here because I'm real close to the break, and I don't want to break it up. But I want to go back and read just a couple of verses from what we saw last week of what these, uh, sometimes people call them qualifications for leaders. Yeah, I, I know what they mean by that, but that, that's a little wrong, too. Uh, it's really more the idea of this is what the character of this overseer, of this bishop, of this elder, of this leader, the character should be along these lines. And that's really, really important to understand that these are character traits. And these are not character traits in the natural. Because you know what? In the natural, we're all self-centered. <laughs> you know, in the natural, <laughs> we're all about this and this and that. In the natural flesh. What these are, these are transformed, born-again believers and here's the character that's in them. It doesn't say that they're totally perfect all the time. It doesn't say that they don't fail from time to time within these arenas, okay? You're not looking for that. What you're looking is for a pattern and practice of behavior that is progressing toward that direction, okay? So let's do this. Let me uh, take a little break right here. We'll come back and we'll read this and we'll look at these qualifications. We, and then we touched a little bit last week why it's important for these to be these type of men and what they're supposed to do, and we'll look at that more, okay? So stay with me. Hi, I'm Jay Mullins with Premier Bank. At Premier Bank, your deposits are insured up to $100,000. Certain IRA accounts are insured up to $250,000. And we've got an FDIC pamphlet here that will tell you how to insure up to $1,200,000. If you want your money to be safe, call me, Jay Mullins, at 737-9900, and let's talk. Welcome back. I thank the Lord for Nick. I tell you, he's a nut. Nick the nut, right? <laughs> so anyway, so let's look at what the Scripture says. Here's what the Spirit led Paul to write to Titus. This is in Titus chapter 1, and he says this, beginning with verse 7. For, so F-O-R, in light, in light of what I've just said in the previous six verses, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, as a steward of God. Now, steward means, you know, how you use the resources that the Lord has given us. Quite often, our mind goes off in the direction of monetary things. And, boy, there is that element. There's no doubt. As a matter of fact, there's more leadership that is brought down because of the mishandling of money than just about anything. Uh, usually mishandling of money and what the, the church wants to call a, a moral failure. A moral failure. 
and the world calls it a moral failure. No, it's just a sin, okay? And, and, and there's sins, and I think, Lord, you can repent, you confess, and the Lord will move you on, okay, and, and do great things. But what he's saying, he must be above reproach along uh, the things that God's blessed with, but not just the monetary things. I think it's above reproach with everything. Above reproach on how you use your life, how you handle your life, how you handle your time. Your time is of greater value than any money you have. You begin to realize that the older you get, right? And so he's above reproach as the steward of the blessings that the Lord has granted. The big, big blessing over all things is the life that he has given. And so this person is a steward that is above reproach. In other words, he's not frivolous. He doesn't waste a lot of time, doesn't waste a lot of resources. Next thing it says, the overseer must not be self-willed. Must not be self-willed. Uh, self-willed is just the idea that it's all about them. All about them. And you know, I know I sound like a, I'm repeating things over and over and over and over again, but I know so many people in leadership that uh, struggle with each one of these things. And, and honestly, uh, according to the scripture right here, they're disqualified to be in the positions they're in because it, they're totally self-willed. Okay? It's totally about them. I mean, it's all about them. And so often that is such a shock because you'll have somebody and you'll hear them teach, you'll hear them preach, you'll see what they're doing, you'll see how God is blessing because God will bless in spite of that. Okay? You see the stuff happen. And then when you actually have an encounter with them and have some time with them, you find out that they're just so self-willed and so self-centered. And often they do it in the name of self-willed. In other words, it's my way or no way. And they do it in the name of leadership. Because I am this, I have this title, I have this position, so therefore it has to be like this. And they think that's great leadership, and it's not. It's just being self-willed. The next thing the overseer must be is it's not quick-tempered. Okay? In other words, not soon to anger. Now, people get angry, and the Scripture says you can be angry and yet not sin. We know that. Okay? But not someone who fires off and reacts. Not someone that when they come in the office, the immediate thing is just, oh, no. Or not someone when they call that fear comes upon people. Why should it be that way? I had a very dear friend years and years ago that went to uh, their pastor about a, uh, an issue within the church. It wasn't a major thing. They just had a concern. And, and the pastor's a great guy. I know him. I know everybody involved with this. But when she went in for this visit to talk with him about this thing, she told me later, she said, I was so nervous. I was shaking. I was sweating. And I said, why? Why do we have that type of fear and that type of reaction when we're simply talking about something with someone who's a fellow believer? It should not be like that. It wasn't because this person was quick-tempered on any part, but the enemy will try to do that. The enemy will make us think, well, somebody's going to blow up, somebody's going to do something. Now, don't be quick-tempered. The overseer can't be. The next thing the overseer cannot be is addicted to wine, okay, or given to wine, as the King James says, addicted to it. Now, the Scripture doesn't say that you cannot partake of such things. As a matter of fact, it references it many, many, many times. Now, particularly when you get the book of Isaiah. We're studying the book of Isaiah right now. You see that, boy, it, you see what's going to happen at the great banquet. The Lord's going to bring forth great aged wine, okay? The idea is the addiction. You can't be addicted to wine. You can't be addicted to cheesecake. You can't be addicted to fried chicken, okay? I know a lot of people who are overseers, who are elders. They're wonderful. They're godly people. But I tell you what, the testimony of carrying an extra body on your skeletal frame undermines the Word of God and the truth. It really does. Okay, it undermines. Uh, out of my background, boy, we jump on the bandwagon about somebody who even touches something and, uh, that is addicted to wine or anything like that, but we think nothing. We sort of chuckle over the fact that they're eating six meals a day and going back for seconds every time. Okay? When the Scripture talks about not being drunk, it also talks about not being a glutton. Okay? So he's saying don't be addicted to drink. Don't be addicted to food. Don't be addicted to anything. Because anything you are addicted to, now a lot of times we'll point to uh, well, cigarettes or something like that. No, anything. There are people that are addicted to patterns of life. There are people addicted to TV shows, okay? Addicted to whatever. He says, don't do this because that is idolatry. Then he says this, an overseer must not be pugnacious. Pugnacious. Isn't that great? Uh, the King James says, not a striker. It didn't really help me a lot because that's not a term that we use a lot, but it actually means that. What it means is this overseer is not a brawler. This overseer is not one that's looking for a fight. Overseer is not one that's sitting there. If they don't get their way and if they're in a meeting, if they're not like that, they're, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Where, and I've seen it bragged about. Yeah, I've seen it bragged about 
how somebody comes in there and boy they get the, uh, this group of people in this meeting and they took control of this thing and there was a little resistance and they just came down and just came down and said this is how it's going to be and everybody went oh okay and they think it's great leadership and they think it's of the spirit of the lord well it's of the spirit but it's not the holy spirit at best it's of the soulish fleshly spirit because somebody's a brawler okay they're wanting an argument they're being pugnacious about it and then this is the end of verse seven all of this is in verse seven and all these are sort of in the negative sense, right? We talked a little bit about that last week. There's some in the negative sense, some in the positive sense. These are all sort of negative. The last one's this. The overseer must not be fined of sordid gain. Fined of sordid gain. Uh, King James. Not given to filthy lucre. Not given to filthy lucre. Other translations. Free of the love of money. That's probably the best one for us to understand. Because fond of sordid gain and filthy lucre, it sounds like, was well, okay to be fond of money as long as it's uh, earned right. No, that, you missed a point with that. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. Remember this. Every one of us that's together right now, every one of us that's alive right now, where we're all gathered together, we are richer than 99.9% .9 of mankind has ever been. We are wealthier than most men have ever dreamed of, even the poorest among us. Okay? The attitude right here is you cannot be fine, uh, fond of the money. It can't be all about the money. And folks, so, so, so often, it's all about the money. I mean, it's just all about the money. Yes, I feel the Lord calling. I feel the Lord's doing this. Really, would you do it and we can't pay anything? Well, no. I, I could give you example after example after example of that type of thing. Now, Scripture is real clear. First Thessalonians talks about that that the, the, those who receive a blessing from those who teach the word, who minister the word, are to help take care of them. Okay, scripture's real clear about that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But there's a difference with having needs met and having greed attained. And that's what's being talked about right here. Cannot be fond of the filthy lucre. Cannot be fond of the sordid gain. Can't have that as the pursuit. And you would not believe how many times I have sat down and had meals and had gatherings and in conferences and workshops and boy it's great and it's wonderful then when you get along what are they talking about i experienced it this last few weeks i'm sitting there and watching some things streaming some things watching some conventions and some conference gatherings of various churches and things like that and they're sitting there really encouraging the flock to give and do all this kind of stuff and everything and i'm thinking you know i don't know the details of this because i don't keep up with this but I highly suspect that that suit you've got on right there probably costs more than the monthly income to most people you're talking about right there. You know what I mean? We're so inconsistent about that particular leadership thing. Now, we've just got a few more moments right here. Let me turn around and deal with some of these positive things. And then we'll come back and pick this up again next week. Because I really just wanted to spend some time right here thinking on these things. Verse 8 says this, but, in light of all that. So let me go back to 7 and read through it. Verse 7, for the overseer must not be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but here's what they should be. They should be hospitable. They should be hospitable. The overseer must be someone who's hospitable. Now, that doesn't mean that they're outgoing in this kind of way or that kind of way. Don't mistake that time. A lot of times we get uh, style over substance confused, okay? We think they have to be me as perky, bubbly, and all that kind of thing. No, no, no. Hospitable is a different type of thing. They really like people. They love people. Okay? They will open up their homes. They will open up their heart, their life to individuals. An overseer must be like that. Uh, a lot of times they're not. I know some overseers right now. They're really good teachers. They're wonderful teachers. But they are so distant from people. And I mean all people. They just don't want to have anything to do with people. And it is painfully, painfully obvious and I think God would set them free and give them a heart of hospitality if they'd seek him. Here's the other one. The overseer must love what is good. Okay? Not just like what is good. Not try to make a decision between, well, the good, the bad, the good, the bad. But love what is good. Okay? Have good in mind. The overseer must be sensible. <laughs> you would hope so. <laughs> okay? But it's not always the case. Okay? Must be sensible. Not, not extravagant, not crazy, not uh, someone that we would describe as unhinged or something. It must be sensible. Here's the next one. The overseer must be just. Okay? Must be just. Must be seeking what is right. The overseer must be devout. Devout. Dedicated to the things of the kingdom. Focused 
okay, purpose of the kingdom of God upon his kingdom and the pursuit of his kingdom must be devout. The overseer must be self-controlled. You know, and that's sort of in contrast to what we saw a while ago with self-willed. In other words, out of control because I want what I want. But self-controlled, that self-control does not come about through the flesh, but it comes about how? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the last part of the verse here, and this is verse 9, the last part of the sentence. This overseer must hold fast the faithful word. Must hold it fast, which is in accordance with the teaching. And, and Paul's talking about the teaching that I've given you, the teaching that we have in the, uh, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, now also the teaching we have in the New Testament. He said he must hold fast to that and must hold fast to the faithful word. That is rare. There's a lot of people who will stand up and preach the word. There's a lot of people who will stand up and teach the word, and they will use the word as a pretext to say what they want to. They'll teach part of it, but they don't hold fast to it. In conversation, in conversation outside of the pulpit, in conversation with committees and things like that, are they speaking forth the word of the Lord, or are they just sort of getting swelled up and well, well, this is what we think, this is what we think, and all this kind of, and there's the difference with it. You can really tell. You can really tell. This person must hold fast to the faithful word. Why? And we saw this at the end last week. I'll make a big deal about it again. <laughs> so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Okay, we must be able to exhort and exhort with a sound doctrine and we must be able to refute those who contradict. So you see that we have a role and responsibility to refute. Not just to sit there and say, well, you know, they're, they're, they're church members and they're probably wrong, but I'm not going to worry about it. You know? No. If they contradict the word of God, you must refute that. You must correct them. Why? Well, we'll have to pick this up next week, but the why begins with verse 10 right here, and we'll see the balance of it next week. For this reason, there are rebellious men among us they're rebellious men among the body of Christ. And he tells us what you have to do with rebellious men. You know what you have to do with them? You have to silence them. Verse 11 says they must be silenced. And you say, well, ooh, well, that's sort of rude. God, I didn't know God wanted us to do that. He wants us to do that to protect the body and also for the well-being of the rebellious men. Because if they're rebellious, that probably means they're not saved. Okay? Tell you what, my time is up. I can't believe how quickly these times go by. Next week, we'll pick up right there and go and learn more about these rebellious men and why it's so important to have the type of leadership that the Lord has called for us to have. In the meantime, go read uh, Titus. See what he's saying right there yourself, and I'll see you again next time.